Hey, thanks for tuning into this message at Calvary Church. We have Pastor Judd Wilhite with us this weekend. And in this message, you're going to hear how generosity will give you what money promises you. And I'm going to let Pastor Judd preach the message for us this weekend. But I just wanted to encourage you. Maybe you watch us regularly. Maybe you're a subscriber on YouTube and you often watch alone. We would encourage you. I want to encourage you to get physically together with other people that you can watch this message with. It's something we call a watch party. We would love to help you start one. We have a little form that you can fill out if you're interested. It's non-committal. You don't have to. We're not going to make you do this. But if If you want to get together with other Christians and have kind of church in your home or somewhere in your city, then we would love to help you do that. So just go to our website, calvarynm.church, and look for Watch Party. You can type that in the search field and then fill out that form. We will be in touch with you, but I hope that you're filled up from this message from Pastor Judd. So listen, you're not only going to hear a great sermon today. You're going to hear a testimony today. You're going to hear a testimony of somebody who actually used to be a part of this church many years ago. And uh, he pastors a church in Las Vegas, Nevada. Did you know there are Christians that live in Las Vegas, Nevada? (laughs) How many of you didn't think that was possible? Raise your hand. No. So uh, he pastors a church, one of the largest churches in the country. I actually just met Judd the other day. Friday was the first time I met him. And I didn't like him when I met him. No, I'm just kidding. I fell in love with this guy. And um, uh, he was telling me on Friday just about his journey of faith. And it's going to be such an encouragement to you. But I'm going to ask his wife to stand up, first of all. This is Lori Wilhite. Now, Lori, would you stand up? Would you just, do you mind stay standing for the whole service. It's just what we do here. It's just, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Anyway, we're just so glad. We know you're a a partnership and we're glad that uh, you came as well. So uh, Judd, uh, you showed up here over 30 years ago and were a part of this church and now you pastor a church in Las Vegas. So it's like a homecoming sort of, right? It's like full circle. And he's going to tell you an incredible story. Please welcome Pastor Judd Wilhite. Ah, oh, Calvary, what a, what a privilege to be here, and what this means so much to me. I'm telling you guys, this for me is one of the greatest moments of my life, to stand on this platform and to be able to share God's Word with you after all the years. So uh, as Pastor Skip mentioned, there are Christians in Las Vegas. It's, it's just like everywhere else, until it's not. Um, I can remember when our kids were little, we pulled up to a stop sign once, and uh, there was a billboard there, and it was five or six women, and they just had their bare backs showing on the billboard and bikini bottoms, and it said, the hits are back. And my son, as innocently as he could, as just a little kid, he says to his sister in the back seat of the minivan, he says, Emma, which naked girl is your favorite? Mine's the one with brown hair. And I remember like all the air sucked out of the minivan in that moment and Lori and I looked at each other like, what have we done moving our children to Las Vegas? Oh my goodness. We're Texas kids. We were raised not too far from here in Amarillo, Texas, and um, we have now served in Las Vegas for over 20 years. It's been a huge blessing. God's grace is enough and he has provided for us and for our families. So. But so much of our spiritual journey, or my spiritual journey, was really formed and shaped here at Calvary. Um, I attended here, I was raised in Amarillo, Texas, as I mentioned, and was kind of went through like a four-year drug addiction. I was pretty much a mess, a wild teenager, and at 17 years old, walked into a church for the very first time on my own terms, meaning my parents weren't making me go. I was going to learn more and explore, and um, that church saved my life. God used those people to save my life, to help me discover who Jesus was, to help me find sobriety in my life, to help me begin to grow in my faith. And about About six months after that conversion moment, I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'll never forget walking into Calvary and knowing this would be my spiritual home. 
And I mean, I was here on the weekends. I was here on the midweek. I went to the seminars. There was like a Calvary magazine they did back then. And I read every single word of it. I remember at the end of like certain weekend experiences, everybody would get up to go home and I would just still be sitting there, just just like taking in all that I had heard. And, and I was learning so much about the Bible. And y'all, when I walked into Calvary 34 years ago in 1989, I was in a phase in my life where I kind of had started to believe that for me, nothing was possible. It comes out of addiction. It comes out of all that brokenness. It comes out of all of that junk in my life. And what I was learning every weekend when I was here is that through faith and in Jesus, everything is actually possible. Now, I'm speaking to somebody today. I've got a word for somebody today because you washed up in here just like I did back in 1989. And you already got this record player playing in your mind that somehow you're disqualified, that God can't use you, that God doesn't have a plan and a purpose for you in your life. And I'm God sent me all the way from Vegas to remind you that his grace is sufficient, that if he called you, he will empower you, he will provide a way for you, and he will deploy you into his purpose in your life. Life, and he does have a purpose for you in your life. I'll never forget when I came here um, back then. I mean, Pastor Skip, to Pastor Skip, I just need to say, like, thank you for being so faithful to God's word. Do you know how, how rare it is to have a pastor with such integrity and such a commitment to God and his word who leads so well? I mean, it's remarkable. And, and in many ways, like, like a once in a generation kind of teaching gift and anointing over his life. And, and Pastor Nate and um, his incredible leadership and the whole team here. I mean, back in 1989, I remember I would come in and, and it was like scales were falling from my eyes every week. And it was God's word and the work that it was doing in my heart and in my life. I, can, um, I remember back then that Pastor Skip not only taught me the word of God, but he taught me how to study the word of God for myself, which is in many ways the greatest gift. And what I want you to understand is you're a part of this church community. You are generous to this church community. You give your time, your energy, your talent, your financial resources. The fruit that this church community bears, you're a part of that which means whether you like Las Vegas or not, you're actually a part of the work that God is doing in Las Vegas, reaching people for Jesus Christ. Because he's used your faithfulness in this church all those years ago to bring tremendous, tremendous fruit. And that was sitting in this room back in 1989. A friend of mine looked at me right before Sunday morning service started. She said, listen, I had this dream. I don't know what to make of it. It was very powerful for me. It wasn't like other dreams I've had. I feel like I'm supposed to tell you, like God is putting it on my heart to tell you about this dream. And I don't know if you've ever had somebody do that to you, but that could be kind of spooky. It could be sort of like, oh. Uh, you know, like, like, I don't know if this is from God or did you have too much Pepto-Bismol? You know, like, like, I'm not sure. And then sometimes you hear some really weird things where you're like, mm, okay, I'm, you know, we'll see, what, we'll see what happens there. But my friend looked at me and she said, my dream, uh, you were standing on the stage at Calvary and you were teaching. Now, this was 34 years ago. And in the moment, I remember thinking like, well, God could never use me. I could never do that. Like, that's not with the mess I've made in my life, not with, you know, all the mistakes I've made. Like, I'm already sort of disqualified, right, from that. So I kind of dismissed it. But years later, I uh, eventually became a pastor, began to lead and teach. And um, I kind of, you know, would think back to that moment and smile. And I sort of felt like, you know, that was fulfilled. And nothing really prepared me for this summer when Pastor Nate reached out to me and extended the invitation to come and speak here and I was like, oh God, you mean that dream was literal. <laughs> and so I want you to know when I get up and say this is one of the most meaningful days of my life, it's because 34 years ago, God planted a seed in my heart and today I get to fulfill the seed that he planted in my heart. I mean, when I got, when Nate reached out to me, I was walking around our house and I just kept tearing up. And about three days in, my wife, she bumps into me in the hallway and she's like, are you, what are you, are you still crying? 
I'm like, I just can't believe God took this messed up, broken 18-year-old kid who thought he had no future and no purpose. And God called him and reminded me, even this last year, that my life is not my own, that I have been bought and paid for with a price, and that I will declare the goodness of God with all that I am until the day that I die. And you know what? Your life is not your own. You were bought and paid for at a price. And you too can declare the goodness of God every day of your life until the day that you die. So this is Generosity Weekend, and I'm thrilled to talk to you a little bit about generosity because I believe generosity and joy are actually linked together. And I want to talk to you today from um, the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to follow along, uh, you can turn to 2 Corinthians. We're going to start 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. We'll also bring these uh, scriptures up on the screen. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 1. And then we're going to go one chapter over a little later to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. And that's where we'll spend the majority of our time. But 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is trying to raise money for an offering that he wants to take for destitute believers in Jerusalem. And so he's writing to the Corinthians to say, hey, you know, we need to collect this offering. He's trying to inspire them to be generous. And as he's doing that, he uses the example of believers in an area called Macedonia. And he wants them to realize, the Corinthians, that these Macedonian believers, even though they had nothing, were generous to this offering for these destitute believers in Jerusalem. And he's trying to use that to inspire the Corinthians to be generous. And so here's what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning of verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Look at this. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now, I want you to notice several things here. First of all, they're in a great trial of affliction. But that trial of affliction, it ultimately work together with their abundance of joy and their deep poverty, and all of that mixed together overflowed in incredible generosity. In fact, the Macedonians literally begged the Apostle Paul to let them be a part of the offering. Like, they don't, like, like they're only one click above the Jerusalem believers that they're raising money for, and they're begging to be a part of this offering. And they've got joy, and they've got generosity, and here's the first thing we're reminded in this passage. How much money you have and how much joy you have are not correlated. The Macedonians had almost nothing. They had deep poverty. We read it. They were under great affliction, but they had so much joy that they begged to be part of helping the believers in Jerusalem. I've traveled all over the world. Many of you have traveled. You'll find that people often in some of the poorest areas of the world have more joy than those of us in the West with all of our abundance. Because once your basic needs are met, how much money you have and how much joy you have are rarely correlated together. And so one of the things I think the Macedonian believers realized is that generosity can actually give you everything money promises you. I mean, money, money makes you a lot of promises, right? Money says, hey, the more money you get, the more, the more you'll have freedom, the more you'll have love in your life, there'll be joy, there'll be peace, everything will finally be less stressful, right? Finally, you won't, you won't have the boot on your neck, right? If you just get enough money, your problems will magically begin to disappear. The challenge is like money promises this, but come on, it doesn't deliver on its promise. All we do all day long is fight and scrape and claw and work to get more money. And let me ask you, do you have more love, peace, joy from all that work? Brings more stress, more problems. Money is the classic overpromise and underdeliver. But I want to suggest today that generosity, living a generous life, actually gives you the things that money promises you. Generosity and a generous spirit actually gives you love. 
It actually gives you joy. It actually gives you a sense of peace. It actually fills you with a sense of purpose. It actually impacts your health in a positive way. It impacts uh, how you wrestle with depression and happiness and joy. There's a book called The Paradox of Generosity, and the authors state in this book that people who are generous rank higher in every single quality of life category than people who are not generous. People who are generous are just more joyful and happy. They're actually living in all the things money promises you. And so how do we become more generous overall in our lives? Here's a simple thought for you today. First is to open your hand. Just to open your hand. I have this friend, John. Every time I see John at church, he'd say, hey, hey, John. And I would look over at him from across the room and he would take his hand, he would open it like this and he would go. And then he would walk on. I'm like, that's, that's weird. <laughs> and then a little later, you know, I saw him again. He yells at me from across the, um, across the lobby at church just as he was walking outside. He goes, hey, John. And I, I look over and I, I see, oh, it's John. And John goes, then he walks out the door. I'm like, I pastor. Look, I do pastor in the circus, okay? Like, it's, it's crazy. You never know what's gonna happen. But, but John was kind of weirding me out. And finally, he came up to me and he goes, Judd, do you know what? Every time I see you, I just open my hand and I raise my arm in the air like this. I said, no, please tell me because it truly is weirding me out. And, and, and John said, listen, I know you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. And what I wanna remind you every time you look at me is to take all those cares and all those burdens and just give them all to God because he's the the only one big enough to carry them. So he says, every time you see me around the church, I'm just going to do this. And he, I see John, John's like, but now I'm like, I got you, John. I know what you're saying. You know, like, you're not crazy. That's a good word. By the way, I did try this at home, you know, after John kind of unpacked that for me. I'm like, that's kind of cool. So I go home that night. Lori's in the kitchen, my wife, and, you know, the dishes are piled up everywhere. And she's venting about all the day's frustrations and venting about the dishes and all this. And finally, I just said, hey, Lori. She looked over at me and I said, <laughs> it didn't go well, in case you're wondering, like, <laughs> don't try this at home, okay? This is, this is about your relationship with God. But, but think about it, like, when we live with an open hand, when we live with an open hand, we are in a position to receive, right? We can receive from God his grace, his mercy, the power of his spirit. We can be filled with his spirit every day. We can walk in, the, in his goodness. We receive all of these things from God, his blessings, because we have an open hand. And then not only do we receive, but we pass on God's blessings to others. And when you bless others, listen, you get the double blessing. You get the blessing of receiving, but you also get the blessing of helping somebody else. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. So you get the double blessing when you live this way in your life. Look at what uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. He says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now, sowing is the idea of planting. It's an agricultural term. So he who plants or, or puts seed in the ground or sows sparingly is going to reap sparingly. Sparingly just means not, they're not going to reap much because they didn't plant much. But he who sows bountifully, in other words, he who plants a lot will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. See, Paul's talking about money and generosity, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is so rich because Paul talks about this biblical principle of sowing and reaping. The biblical principle of sowing and reaping is just this, that you grow what you plant, right? You grow what you plant. I mean, we see it in agriculture. If you go out and you plant corn, what are you going to grow? Corn, right? right? If you go out and you plant tomatoes, you're going to grow tomatoes, right? And I think when it comes to money, Paul's saying, listen, if you want to reap bountifully, then you've got to sow bountifully. He's saying when it comes to their finances in your life, be generous to God, be generous to others, be a generous person, and you will reap the benefits of that exponentially in your life, right? God will bless you as you bless others. And I think it applies to more than just money. 
Like if you plant bitterness in your life, eventually you're gonna grow bitterness up around your life, right? You're gonna find yourself attacked by bitter people just as you attacked others with bitterness. If you grow up uh, hate in your life, eventually hate will, hate will take root. If you plant that, it will grow up in your life. If you, plant, um, if you plant unforgiveness in your life, selfishness in your life, all of those things can start to grow in your life. But the reverse is true as well. If you plant love, You'll start to grow love in your life. If you plant kindness towards others, you'll start to grow kindness in your life. If you plant generosity towards others, you'll start to grow generosity in your life. Now somebody right now is maybe thinking, well, that sounds like karma, right? You know, like, like you know, you, you, you're like you're, you, whatever you do, it eventually what goes around comes around. It's not karma. It's the biblical law of sowing and reaping, of planting and harvesting, and Paul applies it in 2 Corinthians 6 to our finances. Then he says, it's your choice. You can choose in your heart what you wanna give, but you're also choosing in your heart the outcome that you'll have. If you want to reap bountifully, then you've got to sow bountifully, be generous. If you wanna reap sparingly, sow sparingly. You decide in your heart, but then he says, God loves a cheerful giver, right? In other words, God's not asking us to, you know, walk up to the offering box or whatever and be like, oh boy, like Eeyore, I'm gonna give his gift, jeez. He wants a cheerful giver who's giving back joyfully, who realizes he, God does not need our money. Come on, somebody. God doesn't need our money. God has all the cattle on a thousand hills. God has everything he needs. God doesn't need a single thing from us. God doesn't challenge us to give because he has needs. The reality is we need to give it, and we need to honor him. I had a friend who said once, um, 90% with me and God is more than 100% on my own. And what he had learned is when he takes that first 10% and tithes it back to God, God blesses and moves and works through the 90 and multiplies and expands it and allows him to get even more done on 90% than he could have done on 100%. And that's why Malachi, God says, listen, test me in this. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. See if I don't open the floodgates of heaven and give you more blessing than you can possibly contain. It's the only place in the Bible where God says, test me. And that's where it relates to finances. Usually when we read about testing, it's like a parent saying to a kid, don't you test me. <laughs> but when it comes to money, God says, test me. Test me and see if I'm not faithful. And we've seen Lori and I over the years, my wife, uh, how faithful he is. We saw it again recently. <clears throat> we felt a couple weeks, uh, a couple months ago, we felt like really moved to give a financial gift to our church in Las Vegas. And so we prayed about it. There was no like special initiative or anything. I just, we just felt led to do something. And, and so we gave above and beyond uh, a sacrificial gift to the church. And I would never be telling you about this, except it's kind of amazing, like, what happened? We gave this gift, and about a week later, I go to the mailbox, and um, I get an envelope from a friend of mine in Texas, okay? This friend of mine says, I feel led by the Holy Spirit to give you this check. You and Lori personally, I'm, I feel called to give you this money to bless you. We'd, we'd been celebrating in that season that we had been in Las Vegas for 20 years and our church had done some things about it and he had heard about it and he's like, you've been there 20 years. So he gave us this financial gift. Now this has never happened to me before, in case you're wondering. Like, like pastors don't just walk to the mailbox and money shows up, okay? But when I opened that envelope and saw the check, I just stood there and smiled because that check that he gave us was the exact amount as the check that we had given to the church. It's crazy, right? So then Lori and I were like, well, what do we do? We already gave this money. We already, you know, and now it's come back into our lives. And so we took the majority of that check and we gave it to the church as well. And we got the double blessing Right, twice we got to experience Jesus' words, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we got to experience God's faithfulness in that moment, so we gave that check. And I'll tell you, I've been walking to my mailbox every day now, a little, it's just a little different kind of walk. You know, I'm like, come on God, surprise me. I, you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> but the truth is like, we don't give to get, right? 
We give because of all God has already given to us and we honor him and we just put him first. Like we don't give to get, that was never my expectation. But here's what I'll tell you, like I hope God, when you bless others, I hope he blesses you. I hope he blesses you with money, but more than that, I hope he blesses you with all the things money can't buy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, tenderness, self-control. The Bible says these are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And when you think about it, who doesn't want more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness in their life, right? Like everybody's like, yeah, man, I want more of that. I'm down for that. That's what we fight for, scrap for, work for, sale for. That's what we try to buy and purchase. People come to Vegas trying to fill that hole. People like look everywhere trying to, we turn to pleasure, we turn to drugs, we turn to parties, we turn to sex, we turn to all these things. What are we trying? We're trying to fill the hole in our life to find love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Only God can give you that. And a generous life is actually a key that can open the door to more of that flowing into your life. So open your hand so that you can receive more freely from God and so that you can share more freely from God. And then my second thought for you is this, to share generously, to share generously. So I remember um, when my son, my kids were little, we got home one day and we had gone by Taco Bell. My son loved cheese quesadillas. Anybody like the, the cheese quesadilla from, it's okay, you can admit it. I know, I give you heartburn and other things, but uh, he was all about it, you know? So we got the cheese quesadilla, we're sitting there and, and he's got it all laid out, he's getting ready to eat it. And I think I had like a boneless chicken breast, you know, something healthy with broccoli. And so I'm looking at my food, but all I'm thinking about is his cheese quesadilla. <laughs> and finally I looked at him and I said, Ethan, can I have a bite of your cheese quesadilla? And would you believe my little guy, he jumped on top of the quesadilla <laughs> and he said, no dad, it's mine my quesadilla. And then he took it and he turned his back to me and ate it with his back to me so that I could not reach it because he was already familiar with my moves. <laughs> and I remember sitting there and I had some thoughts. You know, at first, I didn't say this, but my first thought was like, little dude, you do not know who I am. <laughs> you do not understand what's happening right now. I could go down to Taco Bell and I could buy so many quesadillas. I could bury you in quesadillas right now. Like we could fill the entire kitchen with cheese quesadillas. I could buy cheese quesadillas more than you could ever comprehend every day for the rest of your life. In fact, that's not even your cheese quesadilla. Technically, it's mine. I bought that cheese quesadilla, and I am allowing you to eat that cheese quesadilla. Come on, parents. And then I start going down the road. Hey, actually, that's my table you're sitting at that I'm allowing you to eat at. And you're under my roof in the house that I bought. And I'm allowing you to be in my house to sit at my kitchen. And even the clothes on your back, those are my clothes. I gave you those clothes. You're welcome. And all I want is one little bite of a cheese quesadilla. Instead, I was stuck. I didn't say any of this. I did think it, though. I was stuck with my chicken breast that night. But I thought about that story later because I think that's how a lot of us kind of treat God. I mean, you know, God owns all the quesadillas. Right? If you believe the God of the Bible, then you have to say, like, Oh yeah, God, God owns everything. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, right? So it's all his. He owns all the, all the quesadillas. And, um, and he shares them with us. He blesses us. He gives us the ability to work. He gives us the ability to dream. He gives us skills and talents. He brings opportunities. He removes barriers. He allows us to earn money. He blesses us with money and, and joy and love and so many different things. He pours his blessing out into our lives. And, 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 and we look at God and we start, to, we say, God, you know, look, I trust you. I love you. We come into church and we sing, God, I give you all my heart. I give you all my life. You know, you're the king of kings. You're the king of my heart. You're the the king of my life, and we trust God. We trust him with 
big things, which we pray for our kids. Think about that. You're trusting God with your kids. You trust God with your diagnosis medically. We trust God with cancer. We trust him with illness. We trust him with pain that we're suffering. We trust him with our eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. We trust God for purpose in our lives and purpose in the world. We trust God for all of these things. But listen, in the midst of all of that, then when it comes to our measly little money, we say, it's mine. You keep your hands off my money. And I wonder if God doesn't look at us and say, oh, you don't know who I am, do you? <laughs> like, you've forgotten who you're dealing with. Do you think I want your cheap little tithes, your little tip money? Do you think I need that? I want to bless you and work in your heart. What I want is your heart. You give me your heart and I will give you everything else. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. So we trust him and God takes care of the rest. In fact, look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Let's pick it up at the very next verse beginning in verse eight. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Think about that. I mean, who doesn't want all sufficiency in all things? God can give that to you. That you may have an abundance for every good work. God can give you all that you need and then some. He can provide for you. So what are some ways that we can be generous? Well, just I want you to briefly think about like three areas where we can show generosity. The first area is with our time. You know, some would say that time is the most valuable thing that we have. You've committed your time this morning, and I applaud you for it, to dedicate to God the first of your week to say, God, I'm starting with you. I'm beginning at church. I'm going to Calvary. I'm a part. I'm worshiping. I give you this time in my life. You've committed that to God. That's a great investment of your time. Maybe this week it means like having coffee with somebody that's hurting or struggling in their life. Maybe it's getting on a phone call with somebody and maybe, or maybe your phone rings. You know what this is about. Your phone rings and you're like, ah, oh. because you know they're hurting and you know it could be a long phone call and maybe it's extra grace required. Come on, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to be generous with my time right now and I'm going to accept this call. What are you doing? You're being generous. You're investing in that relationship. Maybe it's with your family, your kids. Don't reach over those that are closest to you with all the things coming at you in your life. Maybe you invest in your kids, your, your cousins, your friend, you know, your, your family that's right there. And you say, I'm just going to dedicate some time to them today. I'm going to be generous with it. The other thing that we have is not only time, we have talents. You know, you have skills, you have abilities, you have spiritual gifts that God has given you, and you all have them. And you can use those gifts to help other people. That's what's going to bring you so much joy. Uh, maybe you're great with people. You love to entertain. So maybe have somebody over this next week or this next month that is new to town or new to the area or new to the church that doesn't know people. Just try to connect people. Maybe you love to, uh, maybe you love to serve, and, and maybe you served already at this amazing, amazing event, the Thanksgiving pickup party, which, by the way, can we just stop and say, like, it's phenomenal that a church, a church helped 10,000 people in one day. If you think that just happens everywhere, you're smoking something. That's special and that's unique and that's God doing amazing work through you. That's a lot of people showing up using their, not only their time, but their talents, right? And then we have our money. We have the, the money that God uh, blesses us with, and we have the privilege to decide in our heart what we're going to give, how we're going to be generous, to give back to God, and to realize he loves a cheerful giver. I had uh, the privilege in 1989 of learning what it meant to be generous with my money here at Calvary. And I remember coming in, and Pastor Skip did an amazing teaching about generosity all those years ago. I remember in that message, he said, you can't outgive God. And he just challenged us to tithe, to take 10% of what God was giving us and to tithe. And I can still remember sitting there and thinking, I have trusted God with my eternal salvation, but I won't trust him with my money. And what was funny about that is I didn't have much money. I worked at the beach water park. Does anybody remember the beach water park? 
Come on, man. Some of you, when you were kids, I was probably pushing you down the, the slide at the water park. I was the guy that was illegal giving you a little, mm, there you go, a little more. Fly on the, on the bumps, you know. And I remember sitting in church after hearing Pastor Skip give this message back in 89. And I said, all right, God, next pay period, I'm going, which was a couple weeks away. I got paid every two weeks. Next pay period, I'm going to tithe 10%. I'm going to give that back to you. I made that commitment in my heart. And then would you believe it rained multiple days between then and my pay period. And when it rained, they closed the beach and we didn't get paid. And it not only affected me, it affected my roommate as well. And so I remember like I come rolling into church when I did finally get that next paycheck and it was significantly less than I expected. And I'm like, well, you know, God, like I was gonna tithe, but you know, you brought the rain. That's not on me. You know, if you bring the sunshine, I'm be faithful, right? But you brought the rain and I didn't make as much money and like, what am I supposed to do? And have you ever had, I remember having this dialogue sitting right where you're sitting where I'm like, look, God, this church is fine. They don't need anything. You're God, you have it all. I need you to take an offering up for me. Like I'm broke. You have everything, right? I remember that dialogue and that, that tension. Finally, at the end of service, I said, okay, I'm just going to do it. I said I was going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So I had my little fight internally, and then I gave. And it wasn't much. My tithe wasn't a lot, but it was a lot to me. And I was driving back to our little place, or three of us uh, sharing a place together. And um, I remember as I'm driving back, I, I was excited that I had honored God, but I was also like not quite sure how I was going to get to the next pay period. I knew it was going to be tight. And I'll never forget, I walked up to our place and there were all these bags of groceries sitting on our porch. I'm like, what is this? Knock on the door and my roommates were actually inside. And they're like, we don't know. It wasn't here a minute ago. Like we just walked in, right? Here it is. Like all these, all these bags of food. And so we never found out who gave us all this food. But with both of us working at the water park, things were gonna be really tight in the next few weeks. And for me, it was a sign. It was like God telling me, listen, if you trust me, you can know that I will take care of you. If you trust me, you will see that I will bless you and work in your life as you follow me. And that was 34 years ago. Friends, I've tithed for the last 34 years. And I've never regretted it. I will tell you for me, it has been the single greatest financial decision I've ever made in my life. And it's led to a lot of other great decisions. Tithing led me to start getting on a spending plan. Come on, somebody. Tithing led me to start living on a budget. Tithing actually spiritually encouraged me to realize I need to start paying down some debt at different periods in my life. Later on, I made a lot of investments, even before I had much money. And I started making those investments because tithing taught me how to let go of money because it's just a tool. And so I could also send it out in investments and just see if God multiplied it and brought it back. And I lost some, but I made some. But tithing actually gave me the principles to do all of that. And God moved in it and blessed us in it. When I first started out as a pastor, oh, we didn't have anything. My wife, Lori, and I, I, I would have qualified for welfare, um, literally. Like we, everything we had was given to us by somebody else. I remember like uh, we were, I had a couch that was somebody had given me. I had a bed somebody had given me. I had plates that somebody had donated to us, you know. And you, you, you think about how we start out, right? We don't have anything. I look back to those years. God taught me in those years to tithe, even when things were so lean. And you know what we call those years today when we look back at them? We we call them the good old days because while we didn't have a lot of money, you know what we had? We had God, we had joy, we had God meeting all of our needs because all the money in the world won't get you the things that you really want in your life if God isn't in the center. Love, joy, peace. That stuff flows and it flows from God and generosity can start to give you the things that money actually promises you. So this week, I want to encourage you. Look at what's in your hand, your time, your talent, your money, and just say, God, how, how do I live generously with what you've given me? How do I invest generously, live with an open hand, and share generously? 
Let's bow and pray together. God, we thank you for your love. I thank you for each person who's here today. I pray you bless them in their lives, bless their families. God, inspire them and motivate them to follow you and trust you in everything in their life. So I commit them to you, and I ask that you do an amazing work. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, what a phenomenal message that was. I was encouraged by the fact that generosity isn't because the church needs something or because an organi organization needs something. Really, our generosity, learning to be generous, has so much more to do with our relationship, my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with finances. And so I hope that as you take a step of generosity, you find freedom from so much that you need to escape, whether it's anxiety or pain or worry or control in your life. We hope that you are blessed as you enter this journey of generosity. But if today's message was impactful for you, we would love to hear it and share that with others. So you can email us at my story at calvarynm.com church. And if you would like to give towards us as an organization so that we can all help get the word out to more people, you can go to calvarynm.church slash give. But until next time, we love you and we'll see you then.